Catherine Romeo, please clarify the proper way to flush 225 Merc 3.4 liter 2016. I always use the muffs, was told the thermostat doesn't open when flushing or when using flushing ports so the whole motor does not get flushed. My motor seems to climb and temp using the muffs, so I'm using flush port now. Thank you. So that is true. Whenever you use the flush port, um, it does not open up the thermostat because most thermostats have a specific degree on where they open up. On your engine, I believe it is at 143 degrees. And so, yeah, unless you flush the engine immediately after you turn it off, it's not going to get to the other side of the thermostat. But that's not really as much of a problem, I guess, as a lot of people want to say. And I mean, every single engine out there that has been the produced in the past 20 years outside of maybe like, you know, smaller outboards, a two and a half or a five horse, but the rest of them pretty much all have flush ports and the manufacturers put the flush ports in there in a way to where it does flush out the whole engine. I mean, it usually goes straight out the flush port into the block. So it goes through the heads. It goes through this, through the block. It goes out the exhaust. It goes through um, all the rectify regulator, the fuel coolers, the VSTs that are cooled or FSMs, pretty much all the components that are water cooled get flushed when using the flush attachment. And then that water also goes down through the intakes, goes down, flushes the lower unit, flushes the, um, the impeller, the pretty much the entire midsection. Um, on that engine, all the, all the water squirters that go on the, the oil pan. So all that stuff gets flushed. You are correct though, that the thermostat does not open on your specific model. All that is really doing is that, I mean, a thermostat is to control the temperature of the engine and at a specific degree, the thermostat opens up and it allows water to flow out and it just dumps it right into the exhaust. Pretty much all, you know, of the mercuries at least it goes out the thermostat straight down a hose into the adapter plate down into the exhaust and boom it dumps it out the exhaust so whenever you're talking about what is not getting flushed when using the flush attachment you're talking about that one hose and then um, the little fitting that's on the bottom of the hose that go then goes into the exhaust so is it that big of a problem mm probably not um, the only time you're going to see it being a problem like take the l6 for example the l6 at the bottom of that hose that adapter that little um, piece that fitting those would eventually rot out but that would take you know a couple thousand hours and 15 to 20 years in order for that to rot out from not being flushed so if it's is it really that big of a problem probably not because the only downside is that in 10 15 years if it is a problem you just have to change that little fitting out so i don't think it's as big of a problem i think using the flush attachment is the right way to flush the engine um, a lot of people can get anal with it and put it on the muffs but like you said uh, the engines if you try and run the engine on just the muffs it's all going to boil down to your water pressure if you don't have enough water pressure and even if you do have really good water pressure at the hose Sometimes that's not enough and the engine's going to overheat on the muffs. It's just not enough. I, you know, maybe volume of water would be the right words to use, but it's all volume and water pressure. And whenever you, even if you put it in a trash can, if you put it in a trash can and have it on the muffs, the whole nine yards, you can do, you know, put it to the flush attachment and put it in a trash can. Sometimes they, they will still overheat. That's just kind of what it is. So, there are a lot of people out there. I know people that have Suzuki's that, you know, swear by putting it in the bucket and doing the whole nine yards. They put, you know, a salt away in the bucket whenever they do the flushing. And that seems to work good. So I think you can go either too far this way or too far this way. But I think that the flush attachment, the way it's designed from the manufacturers, it functions great. It does flush out the whole engine, all the components outside of the one exhaust dump coming on the other side of the thermostat. Now, every model is obviously going to be a little bit different. So yeah, it's going to come down to the engine model. And you know, most models, 
the same thing as this one where you've got it going into a hose you got a it's like an inch and a half hose so it's a large hose and then the other brands too like yamaha's like the, the 300 same thing it goes into a hose some of the mid-range models like 150 stuff like that on the other side of the thermostat it dumps into basically a big cavity and then dumps it down into the exhaust so you know the benefits of flushing it while trying to run it just to get that other side flush i think you could probably get away with doing something more like running a salt away in there once every three to six months depending on how you use the boat and then that way you don't have to run the engine on the flush for that long in order to open up the thermostat get that salt away up in there and clean out that whole exhaust that tube and all that stuff so if you want to get really you know precise about it and and try and be as preventative as possible then that's what i would say to do flush it on the flush attachment as normal but then maybe once twice three four times a year you can put it on the put it on your flush attachments run it but then also hook up to a salt away on that flush attachment you know on your muffs but with the flush attachment run the salt away in there that way it, the thermostat will open up that salt away will get in there it'll clean up any kind of buildup that's going on that has built up over those few months and then after that you know you only have to run it for a minute or two and that'll be plenty of cleaning and you won't risk overheating the engine and causing other issues with your impeller and you know overheating the engine so that's what i would suggest doing as far as trying to be as anal as you possibly can when trying to flush the outboard use the flush attachments jeep love so i cranked up my yamaha 150 backed it up and tied it to the dock as i was walking back someone spotted water wasn't coming out the telltale was idling fine so i shut off the engine went to replace my bow rollers on the trailer original purpose of going out and returned to a no start it didn't feel warm, but worried I blew the head gasket. Any ideas going to try this first? Then I guess a compression test. Um, most likely irrelated because, um, you know, going from the engine not peeing to a no start condition is a pretty big gap as far as like a train of thought would happen as a sequence of events in order to a no start condition and the engine not peeing aren't necessarily related based on what you're saying because if you walk back and the engine was overheated as far as like getting hot or you know blowing a head gasket and getting water into the engine um you're gonna have alarms going off and it's gonna be you know running rough because it's got water in the cylinder so I, I would hope that those two are not related because if you were able to get on the boat and not have any alarms or anything going off and then be able to just shut the boat off, it just wasn't peeing. That means that it wasn't getting too hot because otherwise you'd have an overheat. And if you, your alarm has a problem, then, I mean, you kind of got multiple things have to happen for that situation to happen. More than likely, you turn it off and you've got an electrical problem being the relay, the starter, um, power getting to the engine, something like that is more than likely going to be the issue where it's just happened to be coincidental that something failed at that point in time. I would also say that make sure that um, nothing wrong with lanyard, the in gear, also does it click, you know, when you hit the key, does the bend, does the starter go up and like try and spin the flywheel? Does it spin over? You know, that's that's going to be where I'm I'm more looking at as an actual no start condition, not necessarily a head gasket water into the cylinders and locking the engine up and now it won't start because you had, you know, a water problem overheat from not peeing. I hate to see that happen, but can't say it's impossible, but unlikely. Matthew Weimer is full throttle bad for trolling motors. Curious as a kayak angler, I have gone upriver for an hour before. Just had a problem with brushes. I don't know if it's related, still in the shop getting fixed. So I would say most likely yes. I mean, 100% yes. So going the more throttle, especially on something like this. So a trolling motor, you got two options. Either it's either brushed or it's brushless. And you know brushless is going to be a newer type of trolling motor they are going to be more expensive but you aren't going to have that problem because a trolling motor is an electric motor i mean it's got brushes like you're saying and so 
the more time that it's spent, the more time that thing's spinning, they wear out. The brushes are going to wear out. So yeah, if you're going wide open throttle the whole time with the trolling motor, then you're going to wear out those brushes quicker. Now, obviously with everybody coming out, you know, um, power pole and, um, Minn Kota and all these other brands have brushless trolling motors now, especially torpedoes, like these other things that are electric, but they're brushless. They're most likely going to outlast the brushed because they don't have brushes to wear out at the same time though you're going to notice your brushes are going out because you're going to start to lose power. So as the brushes wear out, you know, you're going to lose speed. So say that you were able to go, I don't know, five miles an hour with your trolling motor wide open throttle. Well, after a year of use, you might be going four miles an hour, four and a half. You're going to see a degradation in your speed because those brushes are wearing out. And, you know, if you are running the trolling motor full throttle all the time, it's going to wear those brushes out sooner. That kind of brings up the same discussion of brushless versus brushed and which is better. You know, I, I would say that the brushless are going to be better, but they are newer. And so, you know, newer things obviously have different problems, though. I would say probably the downfall to that is that it's going to be more expensive and how quickly will it last or how quickly where it will it wear out and fail i don't know it's going to be more expensive to buy it. it's going to be more expensive to get it repaired so you kind of got two angles of what's going to be worth it to you but i would definitely say that the brushless is going to outlast the brush but if you run mid-range with your trolling motor it's going to last longer being a brush trolling motor than it will if it was brushless. Not really sure if that's really what you wanted to talk about, but yeah, you know, obviously it, it happened to you because your trolling motor's in the shop getting fixed. Bob Bello, why on earth would you not address the bracket condition? This is talking about a video where we did a bracket on a boat and different people have, with their boats don't want to do different things. So in this case, the person wanted to reuse it so that's what we did i mean that's kind of the problem too whenever you do jobs depending on what it is when you're doing things for other people everybody's going to be looking at cost and how they can cut costs and so sometimes people trying to use old used stuff that's going to be what it's going to be you know conditions are going to be determined on what someone wants to do and sometimes a lot of people especially how expensive a bracket can be um, if you buy a brand new bracket, you know, you're talking about thousands of dollars. So a lot of times people will, you know, obviously trying to cut a cost wherever they can. And in the purchase of a large item that costs thousands of dollars, if they can buy a used one for half that price, not as good of condition, they'll do that. But, you know, I agree with you. Sometimes some things should be addressed, but they don't get addressed. Tristan Shaper. I think I've got many years experience on this topic and have read many technical articles on it and you have done a brilliant summary on it in your video. Well done. Great video. Thank you, sir. Um, Tristan, I hope you are, sir, but, uh, thank you. The that's on a video that we did talking about anodes and props and corrosion and just the different things. It's a very broad topic. It's hard to try and come with such, such a large topic and mash it down into something that's consumable and obviously also using language that people use regular because there's tons of technical data and different ways to say things. But one of the obstacles or one of the tasks that we have, especially when making content is being able to teach someone something in a way using language that they're going to understand. And that way people can understand something. Then if you just use all the technical data that you have available and use all these big words that, confuse people and then people can't you know keep up with what's going on so they don't really learn anything so trying to provide as much value as possible that's what we did with that video trying to summarize it i mean it is a pretty cool topic a lot of people don't realize the different processes of hydrolysis and stuff like that where i mean you can literally take you know in that video we took a quarter and a penny you run you you hook your penny up to the negative side of a battery, take the quarter, hook it up to the positive, put that thing in water. And after a half hour, that quarter is going to look like a penny. All the metal is going to go from one side to the other side or the one metal to the other metal. 
And then also just the difference in like a bonding circuit. The bonding circuit in a boat is super important. And a lot of people, they see the green wires and the black wires hooked together somewhere in the boat. And then now all of a sudden they use the bonding circuit as the grounding circuit. And especially when you're talking about things like sensors, stuff like that, like when you start combining all your different, you know, components onto a bonding circuit, you're actually creating different scenarios for this type of electrolytic issue to happen. Like, you know, if you are using the ground going to your fuel sender and you hook that into your bonding circuit, now all of a sudden you're adding current in there because the sending unit on a fuel tank is just a, re a resistance item and it puts power a specific amount of power to the sender and then based on what comes out you know it that's how it gauges the the level in in the float i mean it's kind of hard to describe how that gauge uses that based on the system whether you got a digital or an analog system but either way it is using voltage to and that resistance in order to measure that and if you tie in that ground with your bonding circuit now all of a sudden you, that power is using the, the you're you're adding more power onto the bonding network i guess you would say than there needs to be you don't want to do that kind of stuff and now all of a sudden you've got that current now in your bonding network which is connected to all your through holes it's connected to the other metals that are going out the boat um, the fuel tank and the the fill neck all these different things that are supposed to be connected to spread that load so that way if there is stray current and other issues in the water it's not going to eat up one component but it you know talking about that like if you put connect your ground network or your ground circuit with your bonding circuit now all of a sudden you're losing that protection yes the two the two circuits are connected at the battery but they shouldn't be connected throughout the whole boat the grounding circuit is for consuming you know all your electronics that's your grounding circuit for the electronics and all the power that you're consuming the bonding network or bond circuit is basically to take any kind of current that could be or potentially will be in and around the boat and then throughout the boat you know you've got water in the builds and all these stuff and all these other things anything that gets in there it will spread that load out so that way you don't have one component just taking the hit of all of that on the engine that's in the water because it's it's power it's going to find a way to get back to ground and it's going to take the the path of least resistance a loose ground somewhere will mean all the power that normally uses that ground is now looking for another way to get back to the battery and so a loose ground somewhere could cause all kinds of problems and especially if you got them disconnected like we we're talking about if you have two engines and the batteries in the boat are not connected in the ground circuit, then if you got a problem with one engine, it's going to go through the water, out the engine, over to the other one to get back to ground. And you can have all kinds of problems. The, the amount of problems that you, that you can have are basically infinite. But that's why we made the video and I do appreciate you enjoying it. Mike Smith, I rebuilt my 1996 26-foot Aquasport new transom, new floor. I had 4,500 in material. I bought I bought it for 4,500 bucks. So we got nine G's in it, the motor on it. They thought it had a rod knocking 2003 Honda 225, but it was a mid shaft bearing. I had about $1,800 in parts for the motor. I went through the fuel system also and about 450 into wiring and a thousand dollars into new interior so we're talking nine ten eight twelve or eleven eight you're basically about twelve twelve five in the boat so i got a decent offshore boat now yeah for 12 grand now you got a really nice boat so i'm all about it the 26 footer for only spending twelve and a half thousand dollars and having a good reliable engine reliable boat without everything working the way you want it the interior looking good so awesome congratulations mike glad to hear it dustin keating would a magic wheel be good to use to get the decals off i heard it wouldn't mess up the paint or i heard it wouldn't mess up the paint but it but i'm kind of scared to try it um 
I think you're talking about a, in a, a magic or an eraser wheel that you put on a drill used for getting off decals. Uh, that was on a video that we did kind of showing how to fix a cowling and then repaint it. And I don't know, because an eraser wheel, like I've done, I've used those on gel coat, gel coat way more durable than paint, but I've never tried an eraser wheel on paint. I don't know if it will or not. I guess it depends on how good of the paint job is that's on the engine cowling and what brand it is, but you would think that it would work. I mean, you could also use a heat gun, fishing line, 3M adhesive remover works really well. So you can use the heat gun to heat up the adhesive fishing line, run it across the decal, that'll pop the decal off. And then that 3M adhesive remover, like that stuff is awesome. So that's kind of an easier route or well, maybe not an easier route, but less risky. I've never tried it. I would be interested to see if it does work or not. I guess if you've heard that it wouldn't mess it up, then try it. But I've only ever used it on gel coat and gel coat is way more durable than paint. I would it be in the same position. I'd be scared to rub through the paint and now all of a sudden you got, you know, a discoloration or, you know, a mark in the paint job on the cowling. Butts Krieg, what is a hole shot? Um, a hole shot is basically, I don't know if it's a troll or not, but hole shots just you know, going from idle, you know, you could be in gear idling until you're up on plane or wide open throttle cruising, whatever you want. It's just the time that it takes you to get from idling up and going. So, you know, different boats, different things. A lot of people, especially bass, bass boats. And I mean, a lot of offshore guys, everybody wants to be up and going as quickly as possible. Everybody just wants to put the handle down and within three seconds be up and on plane and going. So, that's basically what a whole shot is. Not, not a whole lot there. Sparky O'Brien, advice from a 40 year tech with cancer from organic solvents, gloves, gloves, gloves. They didn't have gloves per se, as you do now. You still have time to change your habits. Use them as much as possible. Of my fellow techs, about 88% have cancer, some diseased, it, some deceased. It does make a difference even with alcohol and acetone. And you're right, dude. I, um, that is probably one of my weakest points is not using gloves enough. And for sure, for all the people out there that watch the videos and do stuff and work on the boats, try and use gloves as much as you can. I am definitely one of the older people that have the habit of not wearing gloves, just trying to do the work right then and there and not really being concerned about it. And yeah, that is a bad habit. So thank you for the advice and definitely everybody out there, try and use gloves as much as you can. Scrappy. I'm sure some of us are curious of the resale value after all that work. If there was a comparison of what you spent in time versus the resale value of something like this, please. And thank you, um, on the bully netter. So that's a different boat altogether. Like that is a very, very, um, specific niche boat. Like there's not a huge market of people out there that are wanting to buy a 13 or a 15 foot bully netter that has a console built on the front of it. So that boat there is worth, it's, it's worth about 10 grand. I mean, that's probably what it's worth. So in season, uh, when everybody wants a bully netter, the boat's probably worth 12, 13 off season, it's worth 10,000. So that's not really a good example though, as far as time spent, money spent and the resale value of a boat that we do, I am getting better of tracking time, cost, materials and everything and listing all that stuff out. So on our future projects, we are going to be doing a lot better on, you know, being able to have this price breakdown of everything, you know, exactly how much time was spent, exactly how much money was spent and exactly what materials were used and put into the boat. So that way there will be a, an overhead overall comprehensive video ex detailing all of this stuff and then showing, you know, here's the value. So if we do a boat and you know, let's say we got eight grand in it and the boat is worth 20, that way you'll be able to see the whole package and then, you know, hopefully encourage a lot of people out there to do more of the restoration projects and be able to pick up these boats for a lot cheaper. Just like, um, was it? Yeah. Mike, Mike Smith with his 26 Aquasport. You know, he's probably got a $20,000 boat that he's got 12 grand in. So definitely, definitely trying to encourage people to do as much as you can and just enjoy the process of doing it. 
making it your own. That way, everything is exactly the way you want it and how you want to use it. And that's kind of what we try to push. Joseph, Yamaha 250OX66 going strong. That is a phenomenal engine. Not the best on fuel economy, but I mean, we ran a 250 for like three years and loved it. Took that engine everywhere. The, the person that I got the engine off of, they were in the Bahamas all the time, you know, halfway to Cuba, thousands of hours on that engine. We were down in Key West, Marathon, the contents all over the place. Almorada. So, yeah, definitely an awesome engine. Yamaha, really, really phenomenal. Aramish Hernandez. Hi, yes, my question was about the poked holes on the transom for trim tabs on old boats like the Venture boat you mentioned. Mine is an Aquasport with Euro transom. What, did, what a difference have you experienced after through hole installed? So this is an older video talking about boats that you put brackets on them, have porpoising issues or repowers. So there's a lot of boats out there that are older, they get repowered like we did that 99 Venture and that 34 Venture originally came with, I want to say OX 66s. Yeah, it was two, it was twin 250 OX 66s and way different weight ratio for those engines compared to the 350 Verados that it has on there now. So as soon as those Verados, that heavier engine got put on there, same thing for a lot of these boats that get repowered. Back in the 90s, boats were engineered based on the weight of a two-stroke. They weren't built for, you know, the buoyancy factor of the heavier engines in the back. So when you repower these boats, you know, if this is your boat and you put a lot of weight in the back, it's meant for a two-stroke, so it's going to sit like this. When you put the four-stroke on there, boom, it brings that back down. And on that boat, trim tab pockets. So in the, where the trim tabs are, there are pockets there that the trim tabs sit up in, and then they go up and down outside of the pocket. So whenever you put that weight on there, it put the back of the boat down in the water. And now all of a sudden you had a pocket of air sucking the back of the boat down to the water. And same thing for, it looks like for this guy's Aquasport is those pockets. When you do the repower that puts the back of the boat down in the water. And now you've got an air pocket. Now, Whenever you try and get on plane, the back of the boat won't break free. So now the bow is sticking up in the water and you're just plowing through the water and you have a real tough time getting on plane. For that, before we put these, you know, the, the fix that I'm going to say in just a minute, before we put the fix in there, the you would have to jack the steering wheel either one way or the other and try and break it free. And finally, whenever you were able to, you know, jack a turn into it or, or jerk the steering wheel, it would pop that back corner of the boat up, which would let air up in there, which would release the back of the boat from the water. And then boom, you'd be on plane and going. And so what we did was in those pockets, we put in through holes and then hoses that went up to the sides and then out the gunnels of the boat. So now they were vented into those pockets. So when you, you know, got up on plane, it was able to get air down into that pocket and it would not suck the back of the boat down. And that was just one of the things that we found. There's a lot of boats out there that are like that, you know, older contenders and stuff like that, that do have these pockets and, you know, people trying to put, you know, bigger engines on there. Now, I mean, if you're going with Mercury's, obviously the weight difference is not really as much of an issue. I mean, that was their whole goal with the V6, V8 was to be able to replace all the two strokes that are out there where all these boats have these lightweight two strokes and now they won't go to a four stroke because of the weight factor. Well, that was the whole idea with that boat and getting the weight down on that engine. So still a really good topic nonetheless. So yeah, that's, that's what we did. Love that topic. And yeah, now that's something that is interesting to do. So if you got that problem, there's one of your fixes. Lenny Albrecht, love your videos, first of all, thank you. But I was wondering if you guys would do a fuel tank replacement when you have to cut open the floor and then replace it back with the part you cut out as a hatch. 100%, that's the way you do it. So he's talking about a boat that's got the fuel tank down in the deck and it's a solid deck. There's no access to it. The only access is probably a pie hole that gets you to the fuel sender. Um, which depending on the boat might be in the console, might not be in the console, but that's probably the only access that you have in there. And that's what you do. 
a lot of it is going to depend on the finish of the deck if you've got um a molded floor so you've got non-skid that's molded that's going to be the biggest pain but a lot of times a lot of these boats that have them closed off are just a solid deck that have just been gel coated and non-skidded so you pretty much just have to find the measurements out for that you know go in for where you get to the um you know you get to the fuel tank to the fuel sender measure over to the gunnels measure measure over to the bulkheads in the front and the back get your measurements and then cut that thing out and then yeah um a lot of times you want to go over with your measurement it's def definitely difficult i'm not an expert at it by no means but i do know a fiberglass guy that cuts them out perfect every time almost and he cuts it over just enough to where it sits back down on the stringers and the bulkheads but yeah you reuse that same piece and when you redo it you basically just have to refinish the whole deck of the boat that way it's all uniform because they are going to have to patch the um the cuts where that piece was in but yeah the, as long as your deck is solid then then you'll reuse that same piece and then it's just it's a flat surface so it's a lot easier to blend in and then re-glass that deck in to where you can barely you know you really can't even tell and especially if you get something that's good with matching colors then you know when you redo the whole deck you you can barely tell that it was done depending on who does it but yeah that's what you do you cut it out reuse that whole piece and and go for it steve jones prez question does that tray like pan where the block transitions into the middle and lower unit drain out this is talking about washing the outboard and you know cleaning it out being able to put water on there and, and actually wash the actual engine and yeah there's drains in the adapter plate just little holes that drain out so yeah all the water is going to drain out the, pretty much every single outboard has them inside the cowling somewhere because if there is any water that ever gets in there it needs to have a way to get out and so yeah they pretty much all have drains down in the bottom of them thomas Shu. I need a simple hydraulic setup for a cheap bass John boat project trying to do center console Tennessee bass boat. I prefer the old stuff versus the new. Any ideas on a good solid system? Um, well, I mean, if you're going simple and you're going cheap, if you're trying to stay cheap, then um, base star is probably going to be your best, and especially on a John boat. So you're going to have a smaller outboard. You're not going to need a heavy duty hydraulic system. I think the base star is like like 400 430 dollars is what you can get that for and that's going to have your helm the hoses and the steering cylinder it's only going to work for engines less than 150 but if you're doing a bat a john boat um you're probably going to have a small 40 50 60 i mean maybe even smaller on there so definitely going with something like that or you can piece and part together a used system but i mean for $400, you can get an all brand new system. I'd probably go that route. Again, it's gonna depend on what engine you're gonna put on the boat, but a couple hundred bucks for a, for a hydraulic system, it's not bad. And it's, it's really, I mean, I've, got, I've used them before on multiple boats and I haven't seen any problems. Um, it's just kind of cheaper. Janice Babin, I wish for someone to name one engine you can run wide open as often as you can and shown normal life expectancy. I mean, you know, there's just read the comments. There's tons of people in there that are saying that they run their engines wide open throttle all the time. I mean, I've seen um, barge pushers that have like F-150s on them that they run wide open throttle all the time because they're pushing this barge. And I've seen them with 6,000 hours on them. So probably not a discussion to get into. AC Products USA. Always love hearing your take on stuff. I grew up around two strokes, so was very partial to them. Currently have twin Evan Rufik 150s, and I honestly love them. As finicky as they can be, when I started following you, I was able to really get these things singing. As soon as I bought it, brought it home and knew there were running issues, I bought the program to load on my PC and plug in to talk to the engines. Tore into the entire fuel system, replacing hoses, clamps, filters, plugs, and some sensors that I was able to see had been an issue in ECM the history. I am willing to bet you have saved me tons of headaches on the water with your maintenance tips and the one video where you point out how fuel is a problem a high percentage of the time. Thanks. Well, thank you, sir. And also, um, that's awesome. I mean, 
I've always said uh, the Evan Rude Johnson was always a 50-50 brand where there's going to be 50% of the people absolutely hate them and they will, they've had nothing but bad experiences. And then the other 50% absolutely love them and they have had no issues with them. I mean, I've said it multiple times where I, we had an Evan Rude Ocean Pro 2, 220, you know, it was a 250, ran that thing everywhere for like three years, like three, four times a week we were running that engine and that thing start up every time. Obviously, you had to choke it, open the throttle up, let it smoke everything out. We over-oiled it. I didn't mind, you know, changing my plugs out every 50, 60, 70 hours. Just, I mean, it's $10 in, in spark plugs, but whenever you're over oiling kind of what it is but the thing ran for i mean it kept running it never it was super reliable so i would rather change out plugs and have it twice as reliable than trying to get it just right and then run it on the lean side but congratulations i'm glad to hear that you got the fix running nice good job on buying the um, pc program i wouldn't mind knowing what program that was and which one that you got that lets you do everything because um, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there would like to know that. And, um, yeah, they are finicky, but once you get them running, they, they are really, really good. So Greg Feldman, keep a wooden plug tied to your through holes and you won't be looking for them in, in your time of need. That is really good advice. I do like that. Thank you for that comment. That is really good advice. Yeah. If you keep plugs on your boat for your through hole, stuff like that. So like, say you've got an inch and a half through hole. Um, if you keep a wooden plug on to plug that, say you got a problem, you know, if, if a hose breaks or whatever, whatever the problem may be, if you keep wooden plugs on the boat, then, you know, if that does start to leak, you can get in the water, plug it from the bottom, or it, depending on where it's at on the inside, you can plug it from the inside. So thank you, Greg. Great advice. I appreciate it. And I think we're going to cut it there just because we've been going for about a half hour. So if anything you want to talk about, leave in the comments below. Email us, askbab at bornagainboating.com. Check out our boaters program at bornagainboating.com, and we'll see you next week.